Uh, can everybody hear me? Is my microphone working? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, the, as I say, it, Kubuntu is an excellent project in my humble opinion. Um, it's the best community within Ubuntu. Ubuntu uh, as a, is a project, has a number of flavors, Ubuntu Unity and, and Ubuntu and Ubuntu and so forth. Uh, Kubuntu was the first community made flavor um, that I started and it's got the strongest community within Ubuntu in my humble opinion. And, uh, and it's a great community to be part of because you have good fun for six months developing this project and then you, you get flown, flown out to uh, exciting places like Orlando here and, and you get fancy hotels and you, you, get, you get the sun and, and get to swim around. And of course we spend the week working really, really hard uh, on the next version of Ubuntu and, and writing specs and, and we, we're in long tough sessions all day long and it's, it's a lot of hard work but but we find it rewarding and and, um, and because the, the the results and because of the, the good friends that we make we, we find it an excellent project to be part of. Um, yeah this is in Orlando in, in Florida which is a bit of a crazy city because if you most of our cities we spend all day working in these rooms and then going into the center of town but in Orlando there is no center of town to go into for food in the evening um, there is only downtown Disney to go into in the evening or, or um, Universal Studios World so you end up going to having Mickey Mouse burgers or, or Bubba Gump Shrimp Co in, in the evening um, which is a very surreal place but it's all part of the fun of working in, in Ubuntu is going around the world seeing different cultures including uh, mass American culture and uh, and 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 uh, being able to enjoy it and experience that, um, and because I often worked, I worked from home. Canonical sponsored me to work on Kubuntu. Um, I didn't actually need an office. I didn't have any immediate colleagues. Didn't feel lonely at home because you get to talk to everybody on the internet. That, that's all good. Um, but people often said, "Why don't you go off and and work on a Caribbean island somewhere?" So. Instead of going home from Orlando, I went to Guadeloupe here. Um, which does anybody know where the edge of Europe is? Does anybody have a euro note? Anybody got five euro notes on them? Simon, where's my wallet that you had? <laughs> well, anyone? <laughs> here, pass this one. So if you look on the yeah. <laughs> if you look on the back of a euro note, there's, there's what you normally think of as Europe, but also down in, corner, in the corner here, there's random little bits which are also Europe, and turn out they're physically actually on the other side of the world, in the Caribbean or in South America, um, but they're random parts of France, which are part of the European Union, and on the other side of the world. Here, pass that back. <laughs> um, so you don't need... You don't need a passport to get into these places. They use the euro. They they have European healthcare. They uh, um, have uh, all the same laws as, as the rest of the European Union. Um, you don't need a visa to work there or anything. Um, so I thought, why don't I just go there? So I did just go there, and it was great fun. You could sit on the beach all day and, and drink tea punch. And uh, c'est la France, mais c'est la pas la France. It, it is, has a different attitude to life. People are. Uh, a bit slower, a bit, a bit more relaxed, a bit more paced, a bit happier, a bit, uh, a bit more fun. Um, and there's a, there's a rainforest. You could, I could walk out up the road from my house and explore the rainforest, which is uh, incredible. Um, if you've ever been in one, as the sun sets in the night, the, the frogs start squeaking, and there's, there's millions of frogs all around you. Um, it's the loudest noise that you've, you've ever heard, just frogs squeaking away. It's quite incredible. Um, this is Goya, which is the town that I, I lived in. I lived near the hills up here, but it's got a, it's got a nice uh, harbour here. And I always go canoeing. Whenever I go in the world, I enjoy, I enjoy canoeing. So you can um, hire a canoe from here, from the canoe club there. And you've got perfect flat, calm seas that you can just paddle around, anything here. And that's because a couple of hundred metres offshore, there's a rocky reef. Um, if you're standing there, come, come over this side. There's loads of seats over here. You can, you can just come in the other side. Um, so there's a, a rocky reef, so, so all the surf coming off the Pacific um, crashes onto that. So if you're a surfer, and I certainly am, and I went surfing there every day, then you've got perfect surf every day, but if you just want either beginner stuff or you want plain exercise stuff, you can paddle around in the flat water. It's, uh, it's beautiful for anybody who loves that stuff. Um, 
there's a, there's a road that goes around the island here, um, like most of these islands, it's got a single road that goes around the island, there's a dual carriageway road that cars belt round and, and roads come straight on here and I would come up here. So when I went on here one day, a car hit into the back of my car at about 150 kilometres an hour and, and flipped my car over. Uh, my head would have been jolted forward in a, in a sudden rush and I would have banged the head against the steering wheel and the, the brain inside my head, it, it's like everybody's brain of course, it, it, it's surrounded by a sack of fluid, um, that would have been pushed forward into my skull and, and that would have created a large amount of bruising inside, inside of my brain um, and then the clock would have started ticking. The clock starts ticking because as, as soon as an incident like that happens you have to get to hospital as soon as you can, you have to get medical attention as soon as you can otherwise uh, the longer that's delayed then the more chance there are of of not recovering, of having permanent brain damage, of having permanent uh, spine injury w might have been another issue. Uh, so the, the ambulance would have raced out to me as soon as possible. Um, I believe it was a helicopter that came to me. I was obviously unconscious at the time. Nobody, nobody knows if it was. Um, but I read in the newspaper that a helicopter came out and rescued me. Shame, I, I would have enjoyed watching the flight. Um, the paramedics would have, would have taken me from the car, been very careful not to um, be moving my spine in case of spinal injuries. Um, they would have tried to, they would have measured me on the Glasgow Coma Scale, they would have um, shut off the road of course, um, make, make the accident seem safe is the first thing they would have done. Um, shutting off the road would have been a major incident on this island, that's why it was in all the newspapers. Um, they would have uh, flown me into hospital, they would have um, hmm. Well, I don't know what they would have done because I was in a coma and, uh, and I don't have any notes from it. I saw. So what they often do in these cases is they, is they put a probe into your head to make sure that the, the, um, the, the fluid doesn't build up to create higher pressure. So most brain damage gets caused by higher pressure in the brain. Um, and, and so most of the problems after a severe head trauma like this is, is fluid building up, creating higher pressure. I don't know if they did that or not. I was unconscious at the time. I don't think I have any scars, so I don't think they did that to me. Um, but they would have still monitored whether or not my, my brain was still um, active or functioning. Um, there would have been massive bruising, of course, internally into the, into the brain, and there would have been a lot of neurons disconnected, millions of neurons disconnected in an instant, um, and which would have caused me to go into a coma. Um, and, and, uh, and lie around in bed doing not very much. So comas get measured on what's called the Glasgow coma scale. If you've ever been to Glasgow on a Saturday night, it's pretty rough and, and it's, quite, it's quite apt that they have their own coma scale for, for measuring what happens on a Saturday night. And, uh, and it's not an in-out thing, a coma. It, it, it is on a scale of are you actually conscious or are you unconscious? And do your eyes open? My eyes wouldn't have opened. Do I Am I talking about anything? Do I make any sounds? Am I wouldn't have made any sounds? Do I respond to mo movement? So I think if you're all the way down here, then you're, you're, chances are you're going to be dead. So I, I would have been around about three on, on the movement stuff. If they, if they poked my arms or they um, tried my reflexes, then things would have moved. Um, and then over the next two days, I would have slowly w woken up and I spent the next, the next day unconscious. Then the second day, I would have been drifting a bit in and out of consciousness and I had a gradual realization of going, oh, where, something is going on here and then falling back into the coma. Um, I vaguely remember the nurse trying to speak to me, um, but since I vaguely remember it being in perfect French when I spoke to her, that can't be true because I don't speak perfect French, unfortunately. Um, I vaguely remember my flatmate coming along to tell me, oh, you've been in an accident, this is quite bad, um, and then collapsing. I vaguely remember them them sending me home after two days uh, because I could begin to walk and then I collapsed so they let me stay for one more day um, and then oh, on the third day they did send me home, they sent me home in a taxi yeah not, not unfortunately uh, can I, can I go on? they sent me home in a taxi with all my notes so I don't know what happened in the hospital because I was woozy at the time and I left my notes in the taxi um, so I have no idea what happened and I hadn't I didn't know what to do next. I, I was managed to get home, lie in my own bed, didn't have energy to get out and, and do very much. Unfortunately, Canonical One, another fine reason to work on, on Ubuntu as a project, um, getting the occasional private jet flight to anywhere you want, 
it didn't come out and rescue me. Mark had other things with it. Uh, so I had to get on a, on a public airplane and get myself home, which is pretty difficult to do when you're, you're only just about conscious and can only just uh, operate a computer. I uh, had to go to the polis to, to get the all clear, to be able to leave the island, because they, they didn't know whose fault it was. Was it my fault? Was it his fault? Was I drinking at the time? I had alcohol in the car. Maybe I was boozing or something. Um, but eventually I convinced them that it wasn't my fault, or, or at least not enough that anybody would care, and, uh, and that I wasn't boozing at the time. Uh, I had to go to the car hire company and, and kind of apologize to them and, and get my stuff out of the car, and, uh, and managed to get a public flight home. Um, back in Scotland, they, the hospital there gave me an MRI scan, which is, is has anybody ever had an MRI scan? These, these machines are incredible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and these machines are, are pretty much magic. I mean, they're giant machines with giant magnets, and the giant magnets, they resonate at the exact resonant frequency of, of hydrogen molecules in water, and they can use that to build up a 3D image of inside your head, which is it's incredible. Um, slightly daunting experience when going into one. I wouldn't want to do it as a, as a young child being ill. That would be horrible, but uh, I found it really fun and interesting. Uh, this isn't my MRI scan. This is the MRI scan of another guy who gave a talk called What's Going On in His Head. And he's got a couple of bits there where uh, the, the blood isn't flowing in the, in the head, so he's actually got brain damage that will never be fixed. Um, they said that I didn't have any, any bits like that, so I still have a fully functioning brain with, with just disconnected neurons and bits that are bruised, so they, full recovery may or may not be possible. But nobody knows. Doctors so little is known about the brain that nobody knows if, when, when an incident like that happens, if they'll recover or if they'll not recover. Uh, nobody knows how fast they might recover. Nobody knows if they might recover over one year or over ten years. Um, and the, even the terminology used for brain injuries, there is no consistent terminology. So concussion, uh, head trauma, brain injury, acquired brain injury for ABI. Um, there's a couple of other different um, ways to refer to it. Um, mild brain injury, so depending on who you talk to, it could be severe head trauma because I was in a coma for a day, or it might be a br mild brain injury because I, I can still stand up and function and work, but, um, um, but it, so it's not severe brain injury, but the terminology is completely, um, it's completely fluid because nobody understands what goes on in the brain, and, and there is no way of saying there's no dividing line between are you just a bit concussed or are you actually brain damaged. So all those terminologies, they actually just mean all the same thing. So I went home and I, I lay on my back and, and I recovered um, over, over Christmas and Hogmanay and I watched box sets. I watched box sets of House and a few other things. The only time in my life when I ever, ever spent time watching box sets because usually I have better things to do. But the only, thing I, the only energy I had to do was watch television. Um, and I watched a lot of House because it's good, good telly program. Uh, also, I started acting a lot like the character House because he is a grumpy bastard who, who uh, doesn't ha doesn't feel the need to say please and thank you and excuse me. And, and I didn't have the energy to say please and thank you and excuse me when you when you're recovering from a severe trauma like I had. Um, your your instincts um, take over and your 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 rational um, rational mind anything that that takes time and thoughts and a bit of energy, that just goes out the window. So, so I ended up being a bit of a grumpy bastard and, and not, not being very nice to people, but fortunately I have good friends and family who, who were able to look after me. Uh, I also gained an interest in psychology, because at the time, of course, I was sitting lying there thinking, and the only thing I could think of was what's happening to my own brain, what's happening to my own psychology. And as, as geeks were often typically quite bad at understanding people's and our own behavior and our own emotions and our own needs. Um, but as those emotions and needs slowly came back to me, I was able to understand actually why did I act like that? Why, why did I say yes and no? Um, what is the separation between the, the rational mind and the, the instinctive mind? And typically the instinctive mind works a lot faster because it's, it's a lot more primitive in terms of evolution uh, than the rational mind. So noticing when it was that the instinctive mind just made me do something then the rational mind made me agree to it or the rational mind made me go no actually I don't want to do that I want to I want to do something else instead um, so I know I know a guy who's 
a wheelchair user who's paralyzed from the waist down and he says that being disabled is the best way to learn how to understand how the body works. Oh, that muscle does fit into that thing, so that's, that's why I do need that muscle in order to do this action. He says it's a pretty horrible way to understand how the body works, being, being disabled from the waist down. Um, and it's a pretty horrible way to learn how the brain works, but it's a pretty successful way to learn how the brain works, having it completely broken and reset. And it's a lot like Windows 95 as a metaphor. When, a, when, when you're going out in a coma, that's like pulling the power out of a machine running Windows 95 and then boots back up slowly and in, into a safe mode. Um, so you can't, you, you start off with no rational thinking abilities and, and those eventually come back as the, the safe mode turns into whatever normal Windows 95 mode is. Um, I drank an awful lot of Iron Brew, if anybody's been to Scotland. We drink an awful lot of Iron Brew in general in Scotland. I drank two litres of that stuff in the morning uh, just because of the instinctive need of Iron Brew and, and <laughs> because it's got a lot of sugar in it as well, so my body would have, my body would have been using a lot, lot more energy. So a brain typically uses 30 watts when it's kind of at rest and it, during that recovery phase it, it probably would have doubled to about 60 watts in terms of energy, so hence the craving for sugar, which is possibly not the best, best immediate health way to recover, but, um, but sometimes you've got to do what, what, what your body craves and, and needs. So then I went back to work and I work on Kubuntu and I'm really smug that I did manage to go back to work because people who get severe head trauma, 90% of them don't go back to work after two years and I was back at work after two weeks, so I'm pretty smug about that. Um, working, um, we have an awesome community in, in Kubuntu. We, we've got about 50 registered community members and goodness knows how many other people who hang around on or help out on forums and other methods. Um, so they were still uh, working on it and, and uh, building up the distro while I'd been most out of action and they, they continued to be working on it while I was getting back into action. Um, we we release our six monthly releases, we, we package parts of KDE, uh, we occasionally go, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could have a tablet version or a, or a f mobile phone version or something like that, all these plans um, which which we hoped would be supported by Canonical. Maybe Canonical would, would realize that Kubuntu is the way to go as a favorite distro to support. And because we've got that wonderful convergence between uh, mobile phone stuff in KDE and, and tablet stuff and desktop stuff and even server stuff and all throughout KDE. Uh, so we, we have been <coughs> planning and, and we're releasing these as, as they get developed by our wonderful upstreams at KDE. Um, Canonical also supports some other interesting projects like Launchpad and, and Bazaar. Any users of Launchpad and Bazaar here? Really? Uh, one, one, two, good. <laughs> but uh, then they dropped them, unfortunately, or put them into maintenance mode. They took all the developers off both these projects, which is a shame, but reasonably enough, there's like two people who use it, Bazaar. Um, and, uh, and while this was one of Mark's original plans for Canonical would be to to take over the world by distributed revision control, but that was the original usable distribu distributed revision control system. Um, for whatever reason, it, it hasn't had much take up in the world and get, came along and it was much faster, uh, which is a shame because I, I worked on Bazaar for six months and I found it a really nice system to, to use and to develop on. Um, and Launchpad as a code hosting site is, it's still in my opinion, one of the best places to, to host your code, much better than SourceForge or, or uh, Google Code. Does that still exist? Um, but again, very little used. So, so Canonical dropped that, and, and Canonical also made my post for at Kubuntu redundant. So they, they said they wouldn't sponsor me working on Kubuntu anymore. At the time, Canonical was going through a lot of restructuring, and they, they had obviously decided that they needed to make some money, which is not unreasonable, I guess. Um, so they, they moved the developers around from, from these projects and moved Kubuntu, and told me that I couldn't work on Kubuntu anymore. Um, which was a crying shame, which, which I had worked on for the last previous five or six years or so. And, uh, and, and when mixed in with all these other ailments that I, I got as a result of the head trauma, um, I, I felt pretty down about it. So head trauma, it, it's a hidden disability. Nobody, nobody to see you um, would know that you were disabled. And I had a stretched ligament in the back of my eye, so I, I had to wear an eye patch quite a lot in order to stop the double vision, uh, which has mostly healed over time. Um, 
and so this is the only giveaway that I would have had a head trauma, but because it's mostly healed, I don't wear the eye patch much anymore. Um, but I still had at the time, and, and still do to some extent, get all these crazy, weird um, um, problems in my head, and it's completely random as far as anybody is concerned when and, and how much and where it happens. Uh, feeling woozy, feeling buzzy, um, can't can't necessarily uh, move my muscles very much because it, the, if the body decides oh, I've got to put more energy into fixing the head, then it takes away energy from being able to move any muscles. Um, yeah, having not emotions, any kind of uh, mental depression, in in any kind of illness, mental um, health is is well related to your physical health uh, to some extent. But when a brain injury, of course, it is exactly the same. So. So people who have severe head trauma often get anxiety and depression and, and all that kind of stuff, and I'm pretty smug that I didn't um, to any big extent, but I have felt fragile enough at times. Uh, time speeds up is one of the weird ones because your brain slows down when you're it's, it's trying to recover, then, then the rest of the world seems to speed up, so days and weeks pass by. Um, and a lot of memory lapses, what's that person's name, where did I put my keys, the kind, same kind of stuff that everybody else gets, but you get them a lot more and it's a lot harder to think your way through them, actually where did I put my keys, spend hours just searching for keys or, or something else that I, I should know where it is, uh, which would happen in, in normal everyday life, just happens an awful lot more and an awful lot harder to work it out when it does when you've got a brain injury. So mix all that in with, with being told that I couldn't work on Kubuntu anymore is kind of a bit down. Um, and the Kubuntu community here, this is everyone who's registered as a Kubuntu member. Um, did some soul searching going, well, is there any need for this this flavor of Ubuntu anymore? There are plenty of other KDE distributions out there. Um, and we're only a, a, a sub-brand of the main Ubuntu brand. So in terms of mindshare, people who don't particularly aren't enthusiastic, don't care about free software and open source, um, they'll just go to Ubuntu because that's the main brand. So uh, is there a need for this? Is there is there any purpose in it? Should we, should we just give up and, and say, fair enough, and move on? Thanks for all the hot tub parties. Uh, then I got a phone call. Then I got a phone call from a guy called Niall. A guy called Niall, he was a businessman who worked, I can't remember, any idea what he used to work in, Paul? He worked in something where his, he was worried that he was getting a black hat and, and was selling stuff for no, no use whatsoever. And he realized that there are no, all these awesome free software projects out there with business models just waiting to happen, just needed somebody to make those business models fit in with the free software developers. And people in the business world, they still use phones. Um, I can't remember the last time I made an actual phone call talking to somebody for, for half an hour about something. Um, but this guy is really good at making phone calls. He's not good at email and certainly doesn't do IRC. Uh, but he's very, very good at phoning you every single day to say, can we, can we do a deal here? Is there some possibility for you guys to talk to you guys to, to be able to make uh, some income? So he, he phoned me and said, do you want a commercial support service? And he phoned another company in England, do you, do you want to provide a commercial support service for Kubuntu? And at the time I had people emailing me to say, oh, I hear Kubuntu, is, uh, it, its support is being dropped by Canonical. Um, can I, I depend upon this stuff, I, I need this stuff. I've just done a role at my school and, and all these people are, I've told them that we can get commercial support, where can I get it? Um, so he, successfully tried to put together a deal for commercial support. Unfortunately, then blocked by Canonical, who owned the trademark to it and, and um, prevented it from happening for an awful long time, which was a shame. But gave me hope that, hang on, if this person's putting in so much energy, then maybe there is a need for this. If I've got people telling me there's a need for him to put in that much energy, then maybe I should put in more energy as well when I get it. Then I got an email from a guy called Clemens saying, I'm starting up a company called Blue Systems. I would like to sponsor your work on Kubuntu. And I was off. I was pretty skeptical about this because it seems quite rare that somebody just wants to hire you back for the same job that you've just been made redundant from. And I was pretty, pretty reluctant to do it because I was still recovering health-wise. It was a good time to change employer um, from Canonical with this, with this. Uh, this could all go horribly wrong. Whatever it was, but what was he offering? Um, could go horribly wrong, but he kept emailing me and saying, yeah, I'm here, I'm, I just say the word and I'll, I'll support Kubuntu in, in whatever way you want. Um, so eventually I had to go out and meet this guy. Did, does he really exist? Um, I went out to Germany to CBIT, to the massive conference out of CBIT, 
and uh, he does really exist and he did want to help Kubuntu and it turns out that he owns the biggest meat factory in France so if you're a vegetarian then then Kubuntu might not be the distribution for you but <laughs> but he he sold off his shares in the meat factory and wanted new things to to invest in and, and see if they worked and one of the things is is Kubuntu uh, so yay that was great so I, I thought well, that's great. We decided to continue it. The, the community decided that there was a need for it. There were enough people saying, we want KD flavor in Ubuntu. Um, this is the perfect combination of awesome software desktop software and awesome distribution. We use it. We need it. Um, these people provided sponsorship. They provided uh, the commercial support. Eventually, once Canonical got through their, their uh, trademark stuff, and so we were happy again. So we went to a KD conference, and I was still looking a bit ill and a bit ropey, and uh, still need the eye patch, but uh, but happy and decided that we would continue doing this stuff. Um, so there's there's our friendly Kubuntu people at uh, at the KD conference in the, in where's that? That was Tallinn, was it? In, in Estonia, um, and uh, and we managed to get some useful stuff done there and and talk to our upstreams. It's very important as a distribution that we. I've always aligned Kubuntu to the KDE upstream project as much as, as much as I can. I want Kubuntu to be um, a distribution that shows KDE software at its best because I think one of the reasons why I use KDE software is, is not just because it's the first I happen to come across or because the community is so awesome and cute and good looking, but because because the software is so high quality. The, the framework that creates the software, Qt and, and the KDE libraries, they are um, the best and easiest to use. and so. Um, working with KD Upstream by just shipping KD Upstream and making sure any patches go upstream, making sure that we don't put too many changes in the distribution. Any, any changes we put in the distribution must also go upstream first. Um, means that uh, we get the best experience for our users. Um, and then we had another UDS in, in Denmark this time, another crazy hotel, massive big hotel um, in Copenhagen. And, and because of the extra sponsorship from Blue Systems, we, we could sponsor our own people to come out there. So Canonical still sponsored half these people to come out there, and Blue Systems uh, sponsored the other half, and we could get smart shards, and, and we could look like a real presence within the Ubuntu community. We, we weren't just hiding in the corner. We were uh, out there promoting ourselves as the main community part of <coughs> Ubuntu. Uh, so we made another release, console release. Um, and life was good. Life was good. And then a couple of announcements from Canonical sort of made that, made that not quite so good. So Ubuntu Developer Summit, which as I said was one of the highlights of working in Ubuntu, that uh, you get shipped out to Sydney here and you get to uh, meet different cultures, see different parts of the world and, and work on Ubuntu with your favorite people. And, and, uh, in this case it was all in one room, so back then we could all fit in one room and then it ended up in all oh, fitting just about in one hotel, an incredible big um, big event that was happening. Um, they got cancelled, so Canonical said, well, we're not going to fund this anymore. Um, they found some rubbish excuses about increasing inclusion, why they should uh, turn it into an online-only only event, which seemed an awful lot like finding an excuse to fit the lack of a budget for running these things. Um, and that, that made us go, oh, Jings, how are we going to run a community part of our software without a community meeting? Canonical still could still afford to have their own people go to their own meetings, um, but the, the the community that made most of Ubuntu wasn't able to uh, meet in, in in person anymore, which is a big shame and took away an awful lot of what made Ubuntu. And then Ubuntu, the distribution, which started out um, as as promoting GNOME and and community-made software and having naked people on the cover and being an awful uh, being very friendly to enthusiastic crowds like the ones here, um, they ended up redeveloping developing their own desktop, so dropping uh, community-made software from a lot of what Ubuntu does. They made Unity, which is their own desktop to replace the GNOME stuff, um, and, and now they're making Mir, and so they announced that they're going to replace X with Mir, which is insane, which is crazy. Um, so they're moving away from any community-made software, which is just such a such a shame because it destroys an awful lot of what made Ubuntu Ubuntu, what made it fun to work on, uh, was that it was community made. Um, and 
And so now that they're planning to move to their own display server, well, we thought, can Kubuntu continue again? Uh, we can't meet in person anymore, and we don't even have a, a display server to, to work on. We won't get support from anybody else within the Ubuntu community uh, when they replace it with Mir. Um, and also at the time, my, my head trauma, which kind of recovers in this depth logarithmic graph, you, you get periods of, of no recovery. And then suddenly you notice that actually you can stay up until midnight without a big problem. And, and um, things are an awful lot better than they were a few weeks ago. Um, so I kind of plateaued at the time and I was thinking, oh, James, we've got all this, all this problem of, uh, of, of uh, Canonical moving away from the community and then me being a big part of the community that suddenly they're, they're really moving away from. Um, but then the community rallied around. We, we uh, Blue Systems had this meeting. So there's a bunch of people that they sponsor now working on KDE. And uh, and so we had hired out a villa in, in Spain by Barcelona and, and worked from a villa for a week. And this was taking us back to uh, the roots of, of what I really enjoyed about Ubuntu when it first started, which was that we could all fit in the same room. We all knew who each other were. Um, we could we could work on, on a similar kind of project working towards a common goal. In this case, the goal was porting KDE to Qt5, uh, KDE Frameworks 5. So we've got uh, KDE Libs, which is uh, quite big monolithic libraries that add on to the Qt library for making uh, GUI applications, and KDE Frameworks 5, which modularizes that. So it splits it all into 55 different bits. Um, so if you develop Qt, you can just take whichever bits you want, and that doesn't add a big, huge dependency to your application. Talk about that in the desktop room, five o'clock today, something like that. Uh, it's going to be great. You should go. So I really enjoyed working in there. And then we had another academy, and, and these, these continue to be incredible. I mean, does this happen in, in the real world? If you work for Microsoft, does this happen? Maybe it does, but but surely not as often that you get to have rooftop drinks in front of the, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. This is gorgeous. Um, and, uh, and that we could could sing and dance on the on the party at the at the stadium in, in again in Bilbao, uh, the party afterwards. So we had a because the sponsorship from Blue System, we we had a number of extra people there from Kubuntu. So we were able to have a whole day dedicated to Kubuntu and planning our next our next releases or or our next six months of work or so. So the the UDSs that previously had been um, required for that. Um, we're able to do now on a small scale, which is okay because we can we can offer it in the same room. We all know what we're working towards, so we can have a, a single day dedicated towards um, planning the next months of work. Um, and it turns out that it works actually quite a bit better than UDS because um, because it's all part of talking to upstream at the same time, and because we all know each other and we all fit in the same room, um, and we're not just a part of a conference which mostly now focuses on whatever Canonical wants, the, the, the server or the cloud or, um, or their own proprietary tablet uh, Unity Mir software. Um, and then these guys from, from Munich, they have one of the world's biggest Linux desktop rollouts in Munich City Council. They put Kubuntu in all their computers there and they've got a graph in their office of, of how many computers they put uh, Kubuntu on and their target is 12,000 their graph goes like that and then it continues up because the, the rest of the city council said this is so great we should put it on all our computers here um, so they uh, the Limux company who do that in Munich they are again offered us a, a weekend sprint in their offices uh, so we all get together to again plan our work and, and do things face to face and work out what we're going to do um, and so we're all still surprisingly what I didn't expect when when Caronco initially dropped uh, so much of their support for Kubuntu. We're still a functioning community. We still all, all like each other. We still work together. We still have enough energy to be able to do stuff. Um, and we can still do that within Ubuntu. So do you need to be brain damaged to care about desktop Linux is the question. I do care about desktop Linux. I still care about desktop Linux. But sadly not. The world doesn't care in the way that I had hoped the world would care when I first started this in about the year 2000 or so. At that time, we went to Linux conferences. And um, and I remember going to an IBM stand, and the IBM guy was going, "Ah, Linux has taken off on the server now, so we're getting questions about when will it take off on desktop, when will it replace Windows?" Uh, and of course, that never happened, which is a shame, and it's never going to happen for reasons that nobody's quite managed to pin down. Why is 
why is KDE and GNOME fail to take off? But one of them might be the, the fracturous nature of it. We've got KDE here and GNOME there, both trying to achieve the same thing, and then there are half a dozen other major desktops um, that, that have come along all trying to do much the same thing. So that fracturous nature might be part of it. The, the lack of QA might be part of it. One of the interesting things that Canonical now does is, is automate a QA, which um, it probably happens out in normal software companies, but I haven't seen it happen in free software world so much. Um, and Canonical's put in a lot of work to get automated QA, so every, every day the, the Ubuntu build gets automatically tested by, by um, machines, um, and, and that helps them an awful lot. And, and unfortunately, we have some of that in KDE, but not as much as, as uh, would be nice. Um, why else has it not taken off? Um, well, we, there's no integration with the hardware manufacturers. So again, Canonical tried that an awful lot, getting people to integrate with the hardware manufacturers. And a number of other companies have tried that and, and not quite succeeded for, for reasons that nobody quite knows. And then Google came along and have done it with, with Android and, and with Chrome as well. So you can now go to PC World, big big shops, and, and just buy Linux on the desktop there. But it's, it's, not, it's not the Linux that we ex all expected it to be a decade ago, which is a crying shame. Um, but for whatever reason, um, it seems that community-made software can't quite work with um, the hardware manufacturers in the way that the hardware manufacturer would like. Probably they don't pick up the phone enough, so probably it needs somebody like Niall who picks up the phone and calls them every single day to say, hey, we, we've got this great product, you want to work with us. Um, but we're not very good at doing that. So for whatever reason, that hasn't taken off. Um, and in Kubuntu, we still have the problems of, of Mir, which has been put off for the last two Ubuntu releases, um, but may well happen the next release, um, and and when they change display server in Ubuntu, will will Kubuntu be able to maintain either X or will we go to Wayland? Um, but then, do we have the knowledge and the the time and the energy within the Kubuntu team to be able to maintain that? It's still completely unknown, so it might all still fall apart in the next year. We do have an exciting year for Kubuntu. We've got a long-term support release in in April, so we're working on that now trying to remove as many bugs as we can, trying not to add any features, even though it <coughs> is tempting, um, in order to make it good enough for long-term support. But then after that, we've got, do we switch to Wayland? Quite possibly we do. Do we switch to KDE Frameworks 5? Do we switch to Qt 5? Quite possibly we do, and we will. Um, but that will that will probably need a lot of lot of work to make sure that it works correctly with, with, the, uh, with the current generation of KDE software. And that it will work on Wayland, and what happens if you have if you have Ubuntu running Unity on Mir and, and install Kubuntu, will that suddenly install Wayland, and, and how do you pick which display server? All of these are completely unknown, and uh, and well, it's going to be an awful lot of fun to to find out how it all happens. So do come and join us. We're we're an open community that anybody can join. That's the end of my slides. Are there any questions? Um, hang on for the microphone if you have a question, folks. Please raise your hand. One here. All right. Hello. <coughs> um, thank you for your talk. That was great. Um, how, how close is your relationship with the, the Debian and KTE teams? And given all the stuff that Canonical has let us down over the years. Do you, do you have any thoughts about perhaps, you know, supporting a more community-driven distribution? Um, how close is our relationship to Debian KDE? Uh, pretty close. We hang out on the channels and we talk to them and, and, and they're good friends, I hope. Um, we obviously take a lot more from Debian than, than we than goes the other way in Ubuntu in general because we sync all our packages from Debian. Um, when when we add any patches or change anything to the package, uh, in Kubuntu we have a policy of sending it upstream. That isn't the case for the rest of Ubuntu, but certainly in Kubuntu we have a policy of sending it to KDE. But if it's relevant to send it to Debian, then we have a policy of sending it to Debian. How much we succeed in following that policy, we think we're pretty good, but we're not perfect. There'll be plenty of times when we don't send that upstream. Um, in terms of working on joint packaging, well, we're different distributions, so we we can't and don't work on on the pa same packaging at the same time because we have different timescales. But when we have new packages, um, I always say to Debian, there are packages here, please take them so that, th so that we can, um, you don't duplicate the work. And KDE Frameworks 5 has just had a tech preview and I've just spent a few weeks uh, packaging that all. 
and and I deliberately set out at the start to say, Debian, you should you should take these packages um, because otherwise there'll be a massive duplication of work, and that's just silly. Um, so hopefully they will take those packages and, and fix all the mistakes that I've got in them, and then we'll we'll be helping each other, which is always my my aim. Any other questions? If you did decide to change the base distro that you work from, is the community cohesive enough to take them with you? And, and in particular, the user base places like Munich, could you take them to a different distro or even a different operating system? Because presumably they care about KDE and the desktop rather than what goes on underneath. Uh, so should we change the distro or would it work if we change the base distro? Um, maybe, but probably not. When we when we were having these problems, when Canonical first dropped a lot of their support for Kubuntu, we did think, well, firstly, should we keep the name because this trademark, we're we're trying to set up this commercial support deal, and that got delayed for um, six months to a year just because they they didn't have the time or energy, they didn't care about us. We're just a small part of what they do um, to give a simple trademark agreement saying, yeah, you can do this. Uh, so we w looked at changing the name. Um, and we, we brainstormed and we came up with a good name and, and then Mark Shuttleworth said, no, we'll kick you out of the project if you do that. Um, so we had to stay with the name um, and then we decided, well, should we just go to a different distro? And there's a bunch of other Debian type derivatives who do much the same stuff. Should we go to them? Um, but a lot of what is important about what works quite well about Ubuntu is that it, it is um, part of Ubuntu and, and it does have a big, a big following, a big community besides and around Kubuntu, um, and it has a lot of the, the infrastructure like Launchpad and, and the package <coughs> builders. Um, so I, I suspect that if Kubuntu suddenly decided, well, next we're going to change our name and we're going to be another Debian derivative, I suspect we couldn't, we couldn't maintain a lot of the people wouldn't follow us because they'd just go, well, maybe Fedora or, or SUSE would be equally good options. Uh, so we decided against that, and, and we're still quite happy within Ubuntu, even though there are occasional disagreements. Other questions? Another question down here. See, earlier today I asked if people would be considerate and just, you know, stage their questions in order of the room, but no. <laughs> Could you raise your hand again? Is it you? All right. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Watching backpedal. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so you seem to have weathered the challenges that, that have been thrown your way pretty well compared to a lot of the other teams within Ubuntu. I'm thinking of the other flavors and mm -hmm. perhaps the Motu team as well. Um, do you have any advice that you can give these teams, as the things they can do, those lessons they could learn from Kubuntu and how they can reinvigorate themselves maybe? Mm -hmm. So as I say, in my humble opinion, we're the most, most successful and active community team within Ubuntu. I could be entirely wrong. It could just not be hanging out in the right IRC channels or on the right mailing lists. Um, but in order to in order to increase that, well, it, it's important to, that you have a, a community council, for example, and you have quite frequent meetings. It's important that when somebody comes into the channel to say, hey, I'm interested, how can I help out, that there is somebody there who can respond in time, and there's a list of things that they can do. So you can say, hey, let's just look at this list. How, are you interested in this kind of thing or this kind of thing? I can, I can give you a tutorial on how to do this kind of thing. Uh, so that's really important. It's important to make sure that people are on planet Ubuntu um, and that people are blogging so that it's visible. Um, it's important to have face-to-face -face meetings. So, uh, again, getting rid of the, the UDSs, I, I think that will have been quite demotivating for a lot of people who were previously Motu, the, the community contributors to, to uh, Ubuntu packaging. Um, and yeah, there might be interesting ways to, to work out how to sponsor that kind of meeting. Um, but I think I think it needs a lot of um, it needs somebody there as well who can do it almost full time and somebody who doesn't go away on holidays. So a lot of the community managers in Ubuntu that are employed by Canonical they go away for Christmas holidays, which is when a lot of community contributors want to come in because they're they're on holiday and they can do stuff. Um, and I, it's not a nine to five job being a community manager. It's a twenty four hour job. The internet doesn't sleep, and I think. So it, it needs somebody around all the time who's able to handhold that kind of thing. Does that answer the question? Hopefully. Um, I remember a few years ago, near the beginning of the Ubuntu project, Mark Shuttleworth came on stage, and I'm sure I remember he very sort of ostentatiously took off his jacket to show you he was wearing a KDE t-shirt. 
to proclaim that he supported KD as an equal player within the community and he was generally wanted to be seen as a supporter of the community. Uh, I, I love Debbie and I just want to help it was, was his spiel early on. Mm. And that seems to have evolved into something quite different and if you look at his recent blog postings there tends to be quite a lot of almost tetchy vituperation when it comes to engaging with the community. What's changed? Has he become disillusioned such that the whole of Ubuntu is now a disillusioned project. Should you be worried beyond just mere, as was said earlier, and think about unhoisting yourself from what m looks like it might it, he might lose interest in, frankly? Um, interesting question. I don't think he's going to. He's, he's certainly not going to stop Ubuntu being a community project at any time. But will Ubuntu still be a, a friendly place for community to be able to contribute? Is is slightly it's still a bit unknown because when Mirror comes in, might that destroy an awful lot of community-made software? Um, so when when Ubuntu first started, there wasn't a, a definite business plan for Canonical. There wasn't a definite way of this is how we're going to make money. This is this is where the value is going to be added and so forth. Um, so so he did do an awful lot of of um, being nice to GNOME, being nice to KDE, being nice to other upstreams, um, and then it didn't take off. It didn't it. It, there weren't OEM manufacturers who shipped with Ubuntu on it. Dell did a little bit occasionally, but then but that kind of fell away. Um, and then Android came along, and now everybody runs Linux on their mobile phone on on Android with with open source, but not really community made software. Um, so my suspicion is that he's seen that happen, and that he's seen Coracle and other companies not work out in the community made software world, and and has been moving towards. Um, um, in-house made software um, and one interesting thing that they've done that, that free software, community made software is not very good at is hire a design team so there's a, a instead of it being a developer going well I really want a web browser now and starting to code in a web browser you've got people up in a, in a tower um, designing what, what the software should be and then handing out their designs to programmers to code on um, and that will tend to produce more shiny, more slick, more friendly software. That's what Apple is very, very good at, what Microsoft is very, very bad at, um, and and what Mark hopes to emulate with, with Unity and, and everything else. Um, it is still a great community. It's still a great place to work in. Will it continue to be? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, no definite answers in there, unfortunately. Done. Here's a question. Um, we're out of time. We are so out of time. Do come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you, folks. Thank you.